Thank you very much, Peter Rice, for a nice introduction. And uh, good morning and sawadika for the participants. And it's my honor to be here today to share with you on the approach to end mother to child transmission. Um, I was assigned to talk about the best approach, but I think what I can do is just to frame what is the goal of ending mother to child transmission, what is the gaps that be between you and the goal that you want to achieve, and what is a different approach has been used. But in order to define what is the best approach is your job, that you need to decide which one that is met with your clinical practice. Because there are so much difference and variabilities in situation of mother to child transmission globally and also in Asia Pacific. So before I begin my talk, I would like to ask the audience, if you consider that your daily practice is directly related to end mother to child transmission, please raise your hand. Okay, and if you consider that any, your, any of your HIV-related works, it will help to end mother to child transmission, please raise your hand. Yeah, I think the, uh, the bottom line is that whatever you work related to HIV, it will be contributed to the ending of mother to child transmission. And what is the goal of elimination of mother to child transmission? The basic is that all children deserve an HIV-free beginning, no matter where they are, and the goal is to reduce number of babies infected with HIV to lower than 20,000 babies by 2020. And in the past two decades, from the turning of millennium when the ART is just start to roll out in developing countries, more than 600,000 babies was infected with HIV each year. And with the evolving of the way that we use antiretroviral drugs for treatment and also prevention and also access to treatment, in 2017, there are 100 and, 100 and, 180,000 babies infected with HIV. And it's a big gap to go to reach the ultimate goal that we want. So basically, the simple answer is that what is the best approach to prevent baby from infection? They're theoretically, it's simple. Just to have suppressed ART before conception, during pregnancy and breastfeeding. But the difficult thing is that how to deliver it to the people who need that. And overall, I think the change of mother to child transmission is occur because of the change that we use antiretroviral drugs. In 1994, ACTG076, which I think that everyone in this room know about, is the use of ACT monotherapy in pregnant women to reduce transmission to baby. By the year 2000, even though ART is used for treatment, but it was positioned that it's a life-saving treatment for someone who developed AIDS or have symptoms, but not was used as a prevention for asymptomatic pregnant women in order to eliminate mother to child transmission. It's take about another decade until 2010 that the WHO start to recommend that you should start thinking about giving ART to pregnant women in order to achieve a better outcome in prevention baby. And also in 2013 that treatment should be continued lifelong. And that's the only way that we can have viral suppression before the conception. So this is an example of US about MTCT goal. I think the first point is that you have to define your goal. It may be different from settings to settings. In the US before um, using ART, about 1,600, sorry, 16,000 babies, sorry, 1,600 babies was infected with HIV. And the first things to do is to routine opt out HIV testing to all pregnant women. I think it's clear to everyone in the room that pregnancy equals to at least one condomless sex, correct? But I don't know why pregnant women around the world is not eligible for even HIV testing. I think that's the one thing that need to be done, the first step. And then after that, after the use of ART in pregnancy, it significantly bring down the number of HIV infected infants in the US. And right now, in 2015, they reported only 55 babies infected in the US. It seems great, but the goal is not just transmission rate below 1%, but the number have to be below one out of 100,000 live births. So the US is afford only less than 40 babies infected. So they're also towards their goals of elimination in, even in the US settings. 
And what is in Thailand? I think Thailand, we have a privilege that the antiretroviral treatment, even though it's not available for treatment, but the first program that is available is for prevention of mother to child transmission in, uh, in 1990, early 90s, when the ACTG result has come out under the Thai Red Cross program. And now we are setting a goal that even though we achieve transmission rate below 2%, we have to work towards less than 1%, and uh, eventually no baby born with HIV. So I think in, if you see this graph, it's quite similar to the US that after using AR, combination ART, the transmission is bring down. In, in 2018, the reported number of newly infected in Thailand is f about 50 infants, quite similar number of US. But I think the one that we are working in the past five years is not just only to prevent them from infection. We need to diagnose whether that individual is infected or not in order to be a monitoring of the prevention program and also to linkage them into treatment. And at the time of 2014, only 73% access to early infant diagnosis, which need HIV DNA PCR testing, and only 12% of infants access to treatment before six months of age, which we know that the infant is the most vulnerable population that has the most highest mortality rate. So what we did in the ACC program, which is the program that many people in this room is involved, is to identify infants as early as possible, using HIV DNA PCR at birth to identify them and linkage them into care. So by the end of the program in 2018, um, 70% of baby now receive treatment before six months of age. So we not just care about start free of HIV, and they also have to be AIDS free for infant. And Thailand is uh, achieved the WHO validation of elimination mother to child transmission in June 2016. And which country is the second in Asia or the first in Western Pacific? Anyone know? Malaysia, yeah. So Malaysia is the first country in the visual Western Pacific. But the strain is that even though the number of HIV exposed baby is less than 500 cases per year, the political will, the commitment, the infrastructure is there, just only 500 babies exposed per year. Because that is the one of the biggest challenge in Asia Pacific, because it's considered as a low prevalence country. And the biggest gap in the cascade is that even though the symbol of the diagnosis is there, you can use rapid HIV testing for identify HIV positive pregnant women, but only 50% of them in general have access to that testing. So the first thing to do is make sure that pregnant women is get testing. And for baby, even though they are exposed to mother who have HIV positive, but because the diagnosis for baby is more complicated, it's need HIV DNA PCR, in which even Thailand, which have quite a good infrastructure, because of that low prevalence, the government will not provide a point of care testing of HIV DNA PCR, like it's rolled out now in Africa. It have to be centralized lab and have to have a system of sending HIV DNA PCR for infants. So we think the diagnosis part is very critical for uh, improve the cascade for PMTCT. And this is the landscape in Asia. So the biggest challenge is that either low prevalence or considered as the epidemic is MSM and IVDU. And pregnant women is not even listed in the key, key population to work with. And in this um, quite busy table, it can show you that this is the number of pregnant women at, with HIV in each country, and this is the estimated coverage. The first two countries, the big country like India, Indonesia. Indonesia have more than 5 million live births per year. The problem is that the HIV testing is not in the services, so it needs to be done. And the second group is, I think, maybe the number of HIV pregnant women is about right. That is not too low that the government is ignored and not too high that we cannot afford to do some intervention. So in general, the coverage is good. But from the yesterday workshop, the problems of Vietnam is that it was done as a donation program. So after the donation program ends, how to integrate that to the government-funded program is another uh, challenge to overcome.
And for the countries with lower than 1,000 pregnant women per year, probably you have to learn from Malaysia of how to convince that the program is needed. And the second part is on the approach. I would like to talk about three main topics. The first one is HIV diagnosis. The second one is HIV treatment in pregnant women. And the last one is HIV neonatal post-exposure prophylaxis. For HIV diagnosis, this is the term that I heard from Ajahn Prapan, is that HIV diagnosis have to be for parent to be. You need two person to make a baby, right? You need, also need two person to get tested. So both pregnant women and husband should be get tested. And ideally, it should be pre-marriage or preconception because you know that if that person was treated before pregnancy, the transmission rate is 0.2. I don't know if we can make a campaign that if you come for HIV testing without saying what is your result, you will get a coupon to do wedding photo or get a discount for your wedding party. It might be more encourage people to thinking about HIV testing or health checkup before conception. But in reality, we're dealing with the HIV testing during pregnancy and it can have to be two. Usually it's now it's twice as first ANC and third trimester in order to make sure that uh, they are not infected and be able to breastfeeding safely. But if we can twist that budget into two person rather than twice on pregnant women, more on the couple HIV testing and counseling, it might reduce stigma to that pregnant women and also uh, can also get HIV testing to uh, male population. And I think this one is the gap that Thailand is still working on that. Overall, about less than 40% of couple counseling successful in Thailand. And I think one of the issues that should be thinking about is how to use HIV self-test in the settings of um, EMTCT. Because in Thailand, only about 50% of has been present at ANC. So if they not come, can we deliver the HIV test to, to them at home and make sure that they get tested in order to eliminate mother-to-child transmission? Otherwise, we will deal with someone who have incident HIV just infect during pregnancy or postpartum, which transmission rate is almost one-third or back to the same day that we don't have even ACT. The second one is on HIV treatment consideration in pregnancy. I think for pregnancy, you have to care about both pregnant women and also infants. So the first important thing is that time to viral suppression is key. It has to be suppressed prior to delivery. So I think this is the settings that we need same day or rapid ART for all pregnant women. And in reality, you will get HIV testing and then next follow-up visit of antenatal care, which is maybe four weeks a way to be able to counseling and prescribe the ART. We need a way to make sure that all pregnant women identify get ART as fast as possible because we don't know when they're going to deliver baby. And the second one is on the regimen. Whatever regimen we choose, it's not, it's need to make sure that it's not increased risk of birth defect or the risk of preterm because the morbidity of infants is significantly high if they are preterm. So this is a summary of the regimen that was recommended. I think basically the um, two in RTI, it's quite the same, TDF, XTC, either FTC or 3TC. But the one that is significant change in the last two years is the role of integrase inhibitors in MTCT settings. US guideline recommend dorotecovir if gestational age above 14 weeks or rotecovir. The visual is also recommend that because in Africa or in many parts of the world will access to generic DTG. But in Thailand, we are not um, in category that we can get the DTG in the same price. So we decided to use integrase inhibitors for high-risk population who are presented late in pregnancy. But the details of integrase inhibitors, you have to think about when or which trimester should be used. The first trimester cannot be used right now because of the data on um, risk of neurotube defect. Second trimester is no problem. There are no problem on the blood level. Third trimester is encouraged if you just start because you need uh, as fast as you can to suppress virus. So this is the um, details of integrase inhibitors that can be used in pregnancy. Basically is rotecovir and dolotecovir that can be used and have data on birth outcome. 
And I think we have to thank Botswana, which is the first country to use dorotecovir as a first line in adult since 2016. And they are the, per, uh, the country who collect um, data on the birth outcome. And overall, if taking dorotecovir during pregnancy, they are not increased risk of preterms or neonatal death. It's quite similar to the program that when they use tenofovir, FTC, and efferens. But the alarm is occur when they are focused on exposed to dorotecovir preconception that caused neurotube as association of neurotube defect, which is the meningomyelocele and encephaly. The birth defect, it's unacceptable. So at that time, in May 2018, four out of 426 baby had neurotube defect. So which is, it's, it's clearly that it's the confidence interval is not overlapped, so it's some signal. And I'm in the WHO um, meeting that discussed that whether it's too soon to alert people, because it will make um, women not access to dorotecovir. Is it, is it proper in terms of access to care and right? But if it's true, if, if this association is true, the impact is much more than sicker virus that associated with microcephaly, and it might uh, under compromise the trust of using ART in the developing countries. So they decided to make a warning. And the things that need, it's ongoing is to collect data on more pregnancy. And it needs more than 1,000 pregnancy without any new neurotube defect in order to declare that that association might not be true. And there are uh, about 800 pregnant women in Botswana and 400 pregnant women in Brazil that it's ongoing keep uh, data and I think mid of 2019 the visual will convene again and then look at data and give some guidance so need to be um, closely monitored and in Thailand because we aim to reduce from 2% to 1% we identify that most of the baby was born from high risk mother who have high viral load, even though they are only 20% out of the whole pregnant women each year, but they contribute to almost all baby was infected. So we give intensification of ART and make sure that neonatal prophylaxis is three drugs. And this is a pilot program that ran at the Thai Red Cross in 2016 and 2017. So whenever you come to uh, pregnant to, to, to antenatal care. And if you start ART after 32 weeks, then you're eligible for intensification because you have only four to six weeks to go before deliver. Or the entire guideline is recommend that all pregnant women should be checked for viral load close to delivery to give a chance to intensify intervention, either give more drugs to mother, elective cesarean section, or prepare medicine for babies. And this is the result that in the pilot program, about 150 pregnant women were enrolled, and majority is the one who come late. So it's easy to identify, just take history and then take action. It's the same way that when you see patients who have AIDS symptom and then you fast track them to get treatment right away. And at, with the median time of three weeks of radical intensification, 45% of pregnant women reach undetectable level, and about three quarters of them reach 1,000 copies, and it's reduced the transmission rate. Overall transmission rate is 3.9%. Six baby was infect, but three of those are in utero infection. We cannot tell whether they already infect at the time that they present to ANC or not, but uh, for the for the analysis, we have to combine in utero and peripartum transmission. And now it's available in the Thai national program. Uh, I think the gaps is, might be different in other settings. This one is the one that is critical for countries with high prevalence, like in Africa. They are concerned about HIV incident case during pregnancy or breastfeeding. The key message is that pregnancy is not a contraindication for PrEP because in the past, pregnancy should be the exception for many interventions. So pregnancy even should be more on access to PrEP if they have zero discordant couples. And the last one is stigma and discrimination. Sometimes, even though we prepare all the service delivery, but if the pregnant woman or woman is fear of stigma or uh, have shame to, ident to be identified or tested that, that can compromise all the service delivery that we prepare. So I think we need to work with community 
to make the knowledge that if mother has been treated, the baby can be safe or free from HIV. So the last part is on neonatal post-exposure prophylaxis, which when I prepare the slide, I know that neonate is extremely different from adult. When you're thinking about adult post-exposure prophylaxis, either from occupational or from sexual exposure, you just ask the question, what is the root of exposure? And if the index case have high viral load or cannot identify, you will give antiretroviral drugs, simple, three drugs that you have in the clinic for treatment, four weeks, and then follow up antibody. But for neonate, it's very, very complicated. For someone who are not pediatrician would find that it's, it's too complicated. Every infant born to HIV positive mother should get somewhat neonatal prophylaxis, but the regimen is different. If you are low risk, use monocytovidine, which is not even used by other settings at all right now. And if they are high risk, give three drugs, cytovidine, lamivudine, nevirapine, which is not ever recommend for adult. And more complicated, dose is different because they are metabolite is different, the duration is different, and if you want to prove whether the baby was infected or not, need HIV DNA PCR. I think that's why it's, it's make things complicated and make it hard to implement. And this one would be even more complicated, and you can tell that this table might be generated by a pediatrician because it's too complicated. But uh, I bottom line is that it have to be different be, depend on the risk. If they are low risk, so that would be in four weeks. And now, be a guideline, start to think about if use equal you also apply to mother to child transmission, can we just do two weeks or not even give sedobidine at all? I think now that the only guideline that proposed sedobidine two weeks is be a guideline. And if the high risk, the bottom line is that need combination. And I was asked by Chandra Pan, um, do you believe in use equals you also in, in mother to child transmission? Do you okay to give breastfeeding? If, if you have a choice of infant formula, would you give breastfeeding? Because the cell-associated HIV DNA or cell-free HIV RNA in breast milk can also transmit breastfeeding. We are breastfeeding, and the risk is about 0.5 to 1%. So I would like to get a word because I don't have a chance to make it a debate. But um, if you have a setting that mother have viral suppression, and you have a choice of breastfeeding and infant formula, which one would you prefer? Anyone prefer breastfeeding? If you have a choice, not, not just because you don't have infant formula. And infant formula, still infant formula, or not sure. Yeah, I think it depends. I think if, if we think that 0.5 to 1% is the risk that we're not going to take because we want to eliminate, then I'm not giving breastfeeding. But in DHHS guideline, they also recommend against breastfeeding in general. But if you choose to breastfeed, the monitoring mother plasma is have to be monthly. I think the issue is not because we don't believe in use equals you in breastfeeding, but we don't sure that it's constantly suppressed all the time. So in summary, I think it might be um, counterintuitive that whenever you want to do something additional on, you would make sure that you already success in the primary work you do. For example, if you want to do HIV, mother to child transmission elimination, you would like to focus on that. But right now in the British or especially Western Pacific or Asia Pacific, bundle three infection together, HIV, hepatitis B, and syphilis. And I think it might be another way or another approach that when you bundle it together, it make more political commitment more resources to pull together to have infrastructure and work together to eliminate all transmission. So before I finish the job, I uh, would like to share two paintings from the adolescent in our clinics. When I asked them to paint some um, painting about their attitude about future, there are two paintings that I think that it's suitable for our job is that move forward and future is our hand. So do whatever, whatever you can to help elimination of mother to child transmission. And I would like to end that the approach is that make sure that suppressive ART is delivered to pregnant women in need. Stigma is the challenge that we cannot ignore and have to be addressed. 
and go back to your clinics or clinical practice. Define what is your goal. The goal can be national level on your clinics and identify the gaps and close it. And I think even though we try to address the start free in this session, but we also fighting the, say, the next wave of adolescent acquiring HIV through uh, sexual behavior. So in the afternoon, I would like to invite you who are interested in adolescent health to attend the adolescent workshop because we're going to talk about stay free. They already survive and start free, but how to maintain them to be stay free. And I think um, all children deserve HIV-free beginning, and um, future is in your hand. Thank you.